Much of what China's President Xi Jinping does as this country's untrammeled leader, both domestically and internationally, comes from his deep sense of inferiority complex and insecurity, says one of America's foremost sinologists, Dr. Orwell Shell. Dr. Shell, who has been engaged with China since the 1970s, says in many ways, she represents the reactivation of what he calls the genetic material surviving from the days of the Cultural Revolution under Mao Zedong until 1976. That approach is proving to be detrimental to China as a country. Dr. Shell also says it's a fatal mistake for Xi to treat the way he has treated India. In a short but substantive interview with Mayang Shah reports, the distinguished scholar writer and the Arthur Ross director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society in New York also discusses the Dalai Lama and the issue of his succession. Dr. Orwell Shell. Of the Dalai Lama, which was a couple of days ago. So let me start with that first. He just turned 86 and although many Tibetans believe that he will live past 100, such beliefs cannot be the basis for the, uh, the the future of the institution. What is your sense? How do you think Xi Jinping being so determined to perpetuate his own stooge? Where do you see this going now? Well, I mean, there's <clears throat> several questions there. One is in regard to his holiness, what happens? I mean, he's an elderly man. Uh, and I think, of course, uh, Xi Jinping would love to be the one that, that uh, finds and appoints his, his um, you know, reincarnation, just as they did with the Panchen Lama. So uh, I think it's a question of who departs this world first. And of course, uh, Dalai Lama is a lot older. So one, one is worried about that. And I'm not sure what he intends to do, uh, but he's, as you know, he's, he's suggested maybe he'd find someone before he dies and, and that that person would be outside of Tibet and China. Uh, we'll see. Um, I think it's quite, um, quite alarming what's going on within China. Uh, and I think uh, Xi Jinping has, has uh, been a, a very singular leader and uh, surprised a lot of people. But uh, I think what it suggests is that the Chinese Communist Revolution was a lot deeper in the bloodstream of the country than we imagined during those years of reform. Um, I think China might have gone in another direction, but it hasn't. And uh, we now have Xi, who seems to be very firmly rooted in power, and I'm not anticipating any big changes in the near future. Ironically, would you call in, in that case Xi Jinping sort of a Mao 2.0? I think he's, um, he in many ways pretends to that kind of big leader culture that Mao affected. But of course, you have to remember he now has an extremely dynamic and powerful economy behind him, which Mao did not have. Right. Mao had ideology and his notion of world revolution. So Xi Jinping is, is somebody who is, whatever his strengths and weaknesses, he uh, now has the military power, economic power, and he's got the organizational power of the party uh, at home. And as far as we can see in the near future, has managed to, um, to rid the landscape of any pretenders or any political competition. So in the specific context of the Dalai Lama then, if the options were between ending the institution or naming a successor in his lifetime, what do you think uh, should be the way out for him? Well, I think it's really important. I mean, the whole notion of Tibetan Buddhism uh, and the way it, 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 it is structured in monasteries that are built is around the idea of reincarnations of, of high lamas. So I think it's important insofar as he is a traditionalist and a Tibetan Buddhist that he continue these traditions uh, in exile to the best of his ability. And I think his, his intention, as I understand it, is probably proper, that he's not going to be able to do anything in China, and he's not going to find a successor within China. And if he did, they would just be kidnapped and locked up. 
So he might as well do it outside of China. And Dharamsala has its own life and its own, it's its own religious center for the diaspora of Tibetan Buddhists. Right. Uh, you mentioned something rather striking in uh, uh, earlier, as well as in other interviews that I've seen of yours, that the genetic material of the revolution still survives. Uh, is there a possibility of that coming alive the way it did then? Well, I think it has. <clears throat> and I oh, think it she, has. Yes, I think Xi Jinping is is uh, evidence of that. And when you saw him up on Tiananmen in his gray Mao suit the other day, uh, I mean, clearly he's hearkening back to that period where he came of age and where he really was formed, which is during the Cultural Revolution. And I think he is very much... Um, he doesn't share Mao's interest in class warfare, but he does share Mao's interest in a strong Leninist one-party system and in projecting that power out around the world, uh, if not through revolution as Mao did, then through trade and commerce as he's now doing with the Belt and Road. And of course, as I said, he has many more cards to play than Chairman Mao because China has such a large and influential economy and China now has a military, which is significant. Speaking of his speech uh, during the, uh, the 100th anniversary and his utterances after that, he has been talking in terms of China <clears throat> becoming in quotes more lovable. Do you, do you think it's a, it's a possibility or it's just a laughable idea? Well, you know, that the word in Chinese is ke'ai. He said that it has to be more ke'xin and ke'ai. It has to be more credible and more lovable. I thought I would never live to see the day when the Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party was seeking to be lovable. But I think it does say something. Uh, and that is that actually one of the big psychological yearnings of the leadership of China is to be, if not lovable, at least respected and esteemed and not not viewed as some retrograde throwback uh, dictatorship from another era. And I think part of the problem is that she wants to be respected, if not loved, but he doesn't act respectably by the standards of most other uh, at least liberal democratic countries. And that creates a tremendous problem because it plays right into the whole victim culture that is very much a part of Leninism and China's uh, narrative and experience about being exploited, imperialized, colonialized, victimized, persecuted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a very pernicious cycle at work here, which I think, um, is not helping China because actually China is very successful. And, but you can't be successful at the same time that you're a victim. So there's right. a contradiction there. Uh, how then do you think the United States should position itself? Because you uh, had been advocating engagement and in recent months, your views have changed for understandable reasons. That engagement is perhaps not the way to go. Uh, what do you think the U.S. should do at this stage? Well, my view is that engagement was right and proper, that it was a good sign of American leadership that we thought by engaging China in the marketplace, through university exchanges, cultural exchanges, foundations, civil society exchanges, that slowly we might, uh, China's own reform system, might enable it to become a little bit more convergent each year with the world outside. That was the hope. Not, not a liberal democratic country like uh, you know many others, but at least closer and in process to become more that way. So I think that was right. And I think there were times, particularly in the 80s and then again in the 90s, when it was a credible hope that that could happen and was happening. Uh, I think, uh, but I think just to finish the thought, we yeah. get oh, Xi Jinping. Sorry, but sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, when we come to Xi Jinping, that hope ends because we see China no longer reforming, no longer converging. Uh, in fact, 
uh, setting up a very different set of values, political system, and whole aspiration uh, that puts it, it it really at odds and in in an uh, in, in adversarial relationship with the liberal democratic world outside. If that's the case, do you think this is part of uh, Xi Jinping's plan, or it's it's just turned out because of the way he has conducted himself? You know, I don't think this is part of his plan. I think he, he reacts very much sort of tit for tat. You say something bad about me, I say something bad about you. You uh, sanction me, I sanction you. It's a kind of a, 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 a mutant form of reciprocity. Uh, and it, it, it plays up on all the worst uh, effects rather than the best effects of being reciprocal. So I think he's a very insecure leader with a real uh, sense of um, a real inferiority complex, which is part of China's narrative. And it drives him to do things which are not in China's interest. Well, for instance, alienate India, right. alienate ca Canada, Australia, Sweden, the UK, the United States, and one could go on. Since you mentioned India, uh, what role do you think India can assume uh, in not just the uh, bilateral dynamic vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Tibet or even internationally? Because India seems to have been dismissed by Xi Jinping, as it were. Well, I think that is true. And I think it is a fatal error on Xi Jinping's part because India was you know, like Canada, always willing to be a kind of a neutral go-between country. Uh, and I think it's very hard to explain why he would have uh, put all that at risk. And now I think India properly is, is becoming more comfortable with the Quad, becoming more comfortable outside of what I think is going to be a decoupling from China uh, of many, many other countries and indeed alliances. Um, it, it obviously globalization is still a profoundly deep uh, 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 impulse, particularly economically. But I think India is a very interesting case, and it raises the question: What is China doing? How does it think this helps itself? Again, once again, coming back to the presence of the Dalai Lama on Indian soil for so long. And recently, the prime minister called uh, him on his birthday, which was sort of a signal to Xi Jinping. Do you think India needs to change the way it's approached uh, the presence of the Dalai Lama vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, I think India certainly is changing its approach towards China. Uh, it probably should be very careful with the Dalai Lama because it is such a sensitive topic in China. And India has already provided a refuge for him and his exile community. And I think it should, should treat him with great dignity and great respect, but it should be careful that it doesn't gratuitously use him in a way which would get uh, uh, China stirred up unnecessarily because they are very reactive and very childlike in the way that they respond to things. Where does uh, Xi Jinping's confidence comes in terms of ha uh, harping back or doubling down on issues like uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and even Taiwan? I think Xi Jinping's confidence or seeming confidence comes from his sense of weakness. I see. What I mean to say is that I think he's trying to mask his own insecurities uh, and his own kind of probably dim awareness that he is not uh, appreciated in most of the world outside, that, that people are very rapidly uh, viewing China as a, a, a negative force and as a threat. Uh, and, and again, you have to ask yourself, why would the leader of a country that's so incredibly successful and has accomplished so much and actually deserves so much esteem for the hard work of its people and the way it's pulled itself up out of being the sick man of Asia to what it is today. Why would he do that? And I think here, you really have to start looking at Xi Jinping more psychologically than politically and asking what is the makeup of his character? 
how is he formed, and, and what kinds of traits might drive a leader to do what he's done. It isn't strength. I see. In the last minute that we have left, uh, in terms of the U.S. positioning itself, especially the Biden administration, what would be your immediate uh, uh, advice to them? How, do, how should they handle it now? You know, I think, and this is for the first time in my life, it surprises me to be able to say this, but I think Biden and his, his uh, administration have done a pretty good job on China. On the one hand, they've been tough, they've pushed back, they've defended values of, of democracy and, and openness. On the other hand, they've been judicious and they've left the door open to discussions on things like climate change with Kerry. And I think basically Biden's, uh, uh, you know, uh, script is, we'd like to cooperate. Will you help us? And, but we are not going mm -hmm. to give uh, transgressions against the market system, against human rights, against uh, civil society, against the church, whatever. Uh, but we, we do see the necessity to collaborate wherever we possibly can, but that they seem to be saying that must be a two-way reciprocal process. On well, that note, Dr. Chell, I know yeah. uh, we have run out of your time. Uh, right. I'm very <laughs> grateful for this. Uh, I'll send you a link to this pretty soon, and uh, my best Great. to you at some point. Hopefully, I'll see you in person again. Good. You know, I should just say, by way of conclusion, that because it's so difficult to answer the yeah. questions you've asked me, uh, I have uh, written a novel which just came out, which seeks to address exactly some of these questions. So, so uh, you may oh, find wonderful. It's I, I'll, I'll get a hold of it and maybe we'll do a separate interview on that. Well, you can have a look. It's called My Old Home. I'd be happy to do another interview if you if you find it wonderful. interesting. Wonderful. Okay, very wonderful. good. Thank, thank Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate your time. Glad we could talk. Cheers.